I, um, I guess um, I'll give, enough, give people another minute, and while you're uh, sitting here, you can enjoy this little uh, state bingo. Uh, I showed this last year, and the idea here is you're supposed to put a marker down whenever you hear one of these um, <laughs> statements out of, the head, out of the mouth of a, um, well, a statist. Uh, I feel charitable when I pay taxes. Do you feel charitable when you pay taxes? I don't feel charitable. I like the one on the lower right, uh, but Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman said, <laughs> and the one right below that, they lean to listen to our phone conversations to keep us safe. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that, there should not be a free... This is a tragedy of the commons, just waiting right there. No, but, no, you're, should, no, you're entitled to that free space. Oh, I'm entitled to the free space. Okay, all right. Ain't no such thing as a free space or a lunch or something. Okay. All right, well, let's dive right in here. I want to talk a little bit about... Um, I think I've got eight or ten of these kind of common objections to capitalism that you've, you've heard before and if you've taken... Uh, typical uh, high school history or the kind of semester or so of economics they might give you in high school. You might have heard some of these things. And certainly if you get to college and you take um, some certain other social sciences, which will go unmentioned, uh, you might hear some of these from them as well. Um, and you see these pictures, you know, the eight-year-old kids in the Welsh coal mines and the uh, kids in the textile factories that are working and the, as Tom Woods likes to say, the cigar-chomping, cigar uh, uh, top hat wearing, uh, you know, the guy that you see on the Monopoly cards, the looking with the monocle, right, that looks like he's um, exploiting somebody just by getting dressed in the morning. So um, I'd like to, to address some of this. Um, let me just quote here from Mises in his book, Economic Policy, which is available as, uh, in the bookstore, I think, and also in PDF form on the Mises website. It's one of my favorite books by Mises. It's very accessible. If you're looking for, for a book to give to someone who's never read Mises before, this is a good candidate for that because it's, it doesn't require economics background. I mean, if you hand them human action, they're going to say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I want to... And then man, economy, and states. I mean, people are looking at the thickness of this thing in there. So um, I, I think economic policy is one of the best introductions to these kinds of ideas. And he says in that book, you know that the population of this planet is now 10 times greater than it was in the ages preceding capitalism. You know that all men today enjoy a higher standard of living than your ancestors did before the age of capitalism. But how do you know that you are the one out of 10 who would have lived in the absence of capitalism? The mere fact that you are living today is proof that capitalism has succeeded, whether or not you consider your own life very valuable. And uh, he goes on to say that it's, it's not the, the poor who were uh, supporting Marx financially and who were um, initially in favor of some of his ideas uh, he said that it wasn't the workers, it was the landed gentry in England who didn't like the fact that their workers were getting a better deal in the factories than they were on the uh, estates. And so the landed gentry had this uh, motivation, this interest, in portraying industrialization as one of the worst possible things that could happen to workers so that the workers would not go to the cities, so that the workers would stay and provide, continue to provide them with cheap labor. But the, the advent of these alternatives to farm labor, which has always been more dangerous than factory work, um, mortality rates um, in agriculture even today are higher than in factory work. I mean, think about today, I mean, the machines are moving around on the fields. They're not bolted to the factory floor. There, there's an inherent danger in, factory, uh, in uh, agricultural work. Um, most serious injury I ever incurred was working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
um, as a college student in the summers, I went to go work for this organization before I really understood where it came from and what it did. And, uh, you know, I was using machete every day. And uh, that, that was not good for me, which is one of those things that motivates you to continue in your higher education. Um, now, Mises says, from our viewpoint, the worker standard of living under this early industrialization was absolutely shocking. Uh, but he says it's not because these newly developed capitalistic industries were harming the workers. He says it's because they had already been existing at, he calls it, a virtually subhuman level. And when they were going into the cities and living in these packed buildings, um, 10 people to a room or something, and they were, um, had, didn't have access to clean water, and they, didn't have, um, they, they were working long hours, and their bosses were... Um, mean to them, and well, this nevertheless was an improvement on the whole over what they had had in, um, in their previous occupations. And Mises says the evidence of, of this, that they were actually better off in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, is that the population of England exploded during the same time period because children who would have died in previous times had a high enough, the families had a high enough standard of living that they would survive um, and grow to, to have children of their own. So the population explosion by itself, I think, is evidence of the improvement. Um, today, and, and, and Tom Woods mentioned some of this yesterday afternoon, but he says, um, or, sorry, this is Matt Ridley now from his book, The Rational Optimist. He's not an Austrian. But it's very interesting um, uh, uh, statistics on what's happened to our standard of living. And Ridley says, today, of Americans officially designated as poor, 99% have electricity, running water, flush toilets, and a refrigerator. 95% have a television, 88% a telephone, 71% a car, and 70% air conditioning. Cornelius Vanderbilt had none of these. And if you look at the, um, the argument that capitalism is unjust because it, it creates wealth faster for some groups than it creates for others, we can also address this as well. This is from the uh, uh, Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom Index. Um, and uh, if you look at the share income share of the poorest 10%, and you compare that across nations according to um, how economically free those nations are, we see that the share of income earned by the poorest 10% is approximately the same regardless of economic freedom. You can see the quartiles here. Uh, the blue is the most free quartile. Uh, the red is the least free quartile, and we see uh, it's about two and some change percent um, that the poorest 10% receive out of the total income. Now, that being said, if you look at the income levels of the poorest 10%, there is a dramatic difference. And you see the most free, the poor, the poorest 10% in the most free nations have uh, a per capita income of over $11,000 compared to the least free countries where it's about a tenth of that. So if you're going to be in the, in the poorest 10%, it's far better to be in the poorest 10% in an economically free, that is, using the term rather roughly, a capitalistic country. I understand, by the way, that there are some objections to the use of the term capitalism as opposed to free markets. Um, I'm using the term because... That's the term Mises used, and um, uh, we, we understand that uh, those who are owners of capital are not necessarily advocates of free markets. We understand that those who own capital can sometimes engage in rent-seeking activities. They can try to use the state, in other words, as a kind of a, a thug to um, uh, uh, destroy their competition by coercion and artificial restrictions on entry into a business. But that's, I'm, I'm so I'm using the term capitalism simply because um, most of us understand what we mean by that. Um, 
So we get this, this kind of argument that capitalism is unjust, that there's a wealth distribution problem, that, there's, um, uh, that some people are getting rich faster than other people, and um, this, this is absolutely um, off base. Um, the amount of wealth created in free market regimes is, um, or environments is uh, vastly superior to the amount of wealth being created, or you might say destroyed, in uh, anti-capitalistic regimes. Again, to quote from Mises, and, and this is from his book, The Anti-Capitalistic Mentality, Mises says that um, uh, men cooperating under the system of the division of labor have created all the wealth which the daydreamers consider as a free gift of nature. Most, most of the anti-capitalists are looking at wealth as some sort of fixed quantity so that the main problem we have to deal with is a matter of distribution. Who should get this fixed quantity, this fixed pie? So Mises says, with regard to the distribution of this wealth, it is nonsensical to refer to an allegedly divine or natural principle of justice. What matters is not the allocation of portions out of a fund presented to man by nature. The problem is rather to further those social institutions which enable people to continue and to enlarge the production of all those things which they need. And he says the source of the wealth we enjoy is due to this, uh, this uh, expansion of markets in the world. Hayek wrote that once the rise in the position of the lower classes gathers speed, catering to the rich ceases to be the main source of great gain and gives place to efforts directed towards the needs of the masses. Those forces which at first make inequality self-accentuating thus later tend to diminish it. Uh, now there are several things that have contributed to inequality worldwide and within nations. One of, one of these is an increased specialization and international division of labor, leading to a kind of a superstar effect, as some have called it, which means if I'm very, very good at something, I can now sell my product not only within my immediate area, not only within my state, not only within my nation, but globally, perhaps, depending on the, the lower costs of transactions and trade worldwide. So now, with a larger market, I can be even more successful than I have been before. So that is, that is the, the superstar effect, um, an increased specialization. This is, a, this is a good thing that we have increased specialization and increased division of labor. Another uh, possible reason for inequality would be an increased immigration. Uh, immigrants into a country typically come in at a very low level of income. Now their mobility is quite good. They, mo they move up, um, especially if you look across generations. Uh, but that is, a, if you have a lot of immigration, that can be a source of, of any observed inequality. Is it a, um, a social problem that uh, or is it just a statistical kind of artifact that you're introducing individuals into your country who um, happen to expand the lower ranks of income first before they begin to, to uh, integrate into the economy and become more productive? Uh, also, high earners tend to marry each other more than they once did. This may be to, due to better information about uh, potential uh, marriage prospects, but when you uh, look at household incomes and you recognize that you now have people that, that you know, the, the wealthy tend to marry the wealthy and the poor tend to marry the poor and the middle class tends to marry the middle class, um, that's going to tend to, to reinforce um, inequality. I'm not sure what uh, the anti-capitalists would prefer that we do about this. I mean, maybe they'd prefer that we uh, have some kind of assigned spouse. Um, hard enough when you're picking your own that not sure that that would work very well. Um, now, on the other hand, <clears throat> we see some, we see some uh, things that are tending to diminish inequality. <clears throat> uh, for one thing, IQ score spreads are shrinking, not because the high IQs are 
getting dumber, but because we're seeing low, low IQ scores rising. Um, it's a matter of speculation as to why that might be happening. Another is uh, if you look at, at health and nutrition, particularly in the early years of life, we're seeing uh, uh, that there's a narrowing of the gaps, and one of the kind of proxies for this might be um, height. Um, uh, well-fed youth tend to grow a little taller than poorly fed youth, and so if you're looking at developing countries and you look at industrialized countries, you start to see a difference in, in height. Um, British aristocrats were six inches taller than average in 1800, and today they're less than two inches taller than average. The, there's been a narrowing, and part of that's not nutrition, it's genetics and so forth, but there's, there's evidently something happening here. Um, now, one of the, one of the other arguments <clears throat> that we see from the anti-capitalists is that capitalism doesn't make you happy. And one, one, of, the, one of the authors I mentioned on this is uh, a guy named Cameron Mofid, M-O-F-I-D, um, who wrote an article called Global Capitalism in Crisis. And he said that Western wealth creation has created depression and neuroses and anxiety. He says, um, this, this is evidence that, that you can make a lot of money, but it doesn't make you happy. Well, there's been some work on this. And it's, of course, very, very difficult to try to measure how satisfied somebody is with their, with their life. But you know, a lot of the things that, that markets tend to produce, a free market tends to produce, would be um, well, your, your child is less likely to die before the age of five. I'm happy that all of my children have survived to uh, their teenage years. Um, I'll refrain from making comments about teenagers. Um, <laughs> but I don't really, I mean, normally when, uh, when you have a child, that's, that's not, for most of us, a... In the, in the United States and in other wealthy, industrialized, market-leaning countries, that's not a, uh, a huge worry. Uh, maternal mortality is much lower. It used to be a, a huge cause of death in this country um, for women in, uh, that the women would die in childbirth. And we, don't, I mean, we do see that. But it's far rarer than it once was. And now we, we see that the primary causes of death among young people are things like accidents, uh, suicides, and, um, and other things that are not related to the, the uh, 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 communicable diseases and the, uh, the, the childbirth and the infant mortality that we saw many years ago. Um, now, this is a chart that... Um, I believe contains data from a while back. It's about 2003. Um, GDP per capita across nations. And you can see on the vertical axis there, that's the mean life satisfaction. Again, we take that with a grain of salt. We're not sure how people measure life satisfaction. It's a subjective thing. But self-reported life satisfaction. And then on the horizontal axis, we've got per capita income. Okay. And uh, the diameter of the circles on the graph indicate the populations of the countries here. So you see the couple of large bubbles there down the lower left-hand side of the diagram would be India and China. Um, USA is on the upper right there. And you can see a positive correlation there between self-reported life satisfaction and income. Uh, the Danes are evidently extremely happy and satisfied with themselves, and they, um, they have not the highest, but they have a reasonably high income. Um, and then on the low end, you have um, some nations in sub-Saharan Africa, which are both poor and, according to their own reports, not terribly satisfied with life either. There does appear to be a connection. Now, this is in opposition to a... Um, uh, a 1974 study that was quoted endlessly, a study by Richard Easterlin, which said that 
uh, people are not happier as they get wealthier, and yet uh, there are more recent studies that indicate that that's just not true. Um, two studies in 2008 showed that rich people tend to be happier than poor people, rich countries have happier people than poor countries, uh, people get happier as they get richer. I mean, however many different ways you want to put this, they, there does seem to be a connection. Now, we can point to celebrities who have gobs of money and then they, they uh, commit suicide or something, and we can say, well, see, the wealth didn't make them happy. True. But if you look at groups of people, we don't tend to see uh, that wealth is leading people to depression. Um, Mises says, in colloquial speech, we call a man happy who has succeeded in attaining his ends. A more adequate description of his state would be that he is happier than he was before. There is, however, no valid objection to a usage that defines human action as the striving for happiness. The more free you are then to pursue your own ends, the more happy you will tend to be on the whole. Now, what about this argument that capitalism puts economics before people? I want to spend some time on this. There are a lot of people who will argue that um, capitalism or markets are very effective at creating a lot of stuff, but they do so in a way that rewards firms that don't look out for the well-being of their customers or their employees or their suppliers. And therefore, we need to have intervention by the government to try to prevent firms from exploiting their workers or their, or their customers. Now, I'll, um, I, I mentioned some of this in my earlier talk this week on product regulation, um, product safety, and, and I, I won't revisit a lot of that. In fact, I was not the only one this week who talked about that. Uh, I think one of the talks yesterday touched on product safety issues. But let me mention something uh, that I ran across recently on a site that I had not heard of before until recently. Maybe some of you have. It's apparently a um, group that's got a something out for libertarians. Um, uh, Pando.com, and they had an article responding to a fee that Uber um, had, had started to Im impose on um, their customers. Now, if you don't know what Uber is, well, I understand. I didn't know what Uber was either until a few weeks ago. <laughs> uh, and um, Uber is a kind of a, a system that allows an individual to connect with somebody who's got a car and they're willing to give somebody a ride for a small amount of money. You think, well, that sounds like a taxi. Yeah, uh, it, it is sort of like a taxi, except um, that it's not licensed. It's not, um, it doesn't have a medallion on the hood. It doesn't have these, um, uh, these, uh, regulations imposed by the state, which has gotten Uber into some hot water in some places. I understand uh, Seoul, South Korea um, has recently banned Uber, and there's some other countries where, or cities where um, Uber has been uh, hit with various restrictions because the taxi drivers don't like the fact that they've got this competition. Well, so anyway, and, and there's some other apps that I talked about earlier in the week that are like this, that are simply allowing people to uh, exchange with each other with lower costs. So Pando says the response of UberX users in the days ahead will be telling, the response to this $1 fee they were tacking on uh, for safety, um, Uber, uh, the Pando.com author was saying, well, this is, this is just another way to gouge the consumer. Um, they say it's entirely possible that people will recoil at Uber's deployment of the well-worn libertarian strategy of forwarding the cost of compliance with regulation onto customers. This is a libertarian plot, apparently, that 
when a firm incurs a higher cost, the price of their product rises, which is exactly what was happening. I mean, Uber was having to uh, adopt some additional insurance and some other, um, uh, other means that were costly to make sure that when you got into a car with someone and they were going to drive you somewhere that you felt safe and that you were in fact safe, not just uh, creating a feeling, but you, that you were assured that this was, um, that, that your interests were being taken care of. Now, what I find odd here is that if the government taxed a regulation onto a firm, apparently this author would say that this, is, that this cost is not passed on to the customer. So the government can regulate, regulate, regulate. The firms feel heavier and heavier costs and that keep the price the same. Is that what happens? So here we have a firm that is trying to find a balance between the optimal level of safety and the various means they can undertake to ensure that safety and the price that people are willing and able to pay. Now, I, I would like to be able to say that this kind of attack on, uh, on markets is limited to people like this Pando.com website and, and people who are you know, self-proclaimed Marxists, or I don't know what Pando says. They may, be, they may say they're Marxists, they may not. I don't, I don't know. But um, I'd like to be able to say that. But there, there, sometimes you hear some startling things out of the mouths of people who have a reputation of being pro-market. Pro-freedom. For example, I was listening the other day, um, this is, uh, um, actually it was July 7th to be specific in case you want to look it up. I was listening to a podcast by uh, Russ Roberts um, interviewing Michael Munger. And um, uh, I think Russ Roberts has at least libertarian leanings. Um, he might even call himself a libertarian, I'm not sure. Um, and he was interviewing Mike Munger about Uber and some other things, uh, similar kinds of apps. And Munger inserts in his conversation on this, which I thought was generally very edifying, he inserts in this, into this conversation the, the thought that perhaps taxi drivers might be entitled to some compensation for the loss of their monopoly rents. So, since I think World War II, taxis in New York City and, and, and some other, cit other cities around the, in, in the country have had to have a license evidenced by this bronze medallion on the hood, and that license gives them the ability to pick up a passenger who is standing on the sidewalk with his hand raised like this, and if, if you're a private person in a car, you're not supposed to do that. Now, limo services are another matter, and you can call a limo, they show up, and they limo. You know, it's not necessarily a, what you think of as a stereotypical limo, but you can call somebody that can show up and pick you up and take you somewhere. But taxis have been limited to several thousand in the city of New York, uh, city of New York and also in Chicago. So Munger's saying, well, maybe, you know, it's the thinkable thought that taxi drivers should be compensated because they're, the, the, very high priced licenses, and these, these things sell for six figures, and no, seven figures on the market. And there are people who own, not the drivers, but the, there are people who own multiple taxicab medallions and lease them out. And these things have value because the government has kept the competition out. Occasionally, the government will release some more medallions, auction off some more medallions, which lowers the, the equilibrium price of these things. Now, Munger says, well, how is a monopoly over taxi services different from a monopoly over the use of his land? Which is what a, a land title grants you. If you have a, 
piece of property, the government will support your right to that land, mostly, by saying you, you can keep other people off, mostly. And that you might even have a piece of paper that says title on it, that says this is evidence that this particular piece of property belongs to you. No one else can use it without your permission. And the value of that land title is, well, it's there because you have the right to prohibit other entry onto that property. Now, I would argue that my land title does not provide me with a right to the value of my land. I have a little postage stamp lot near Greenville, South Carolina. I have an idea what the market value is, but if somehow somebody came up with a way to add significantly to the housing supply in my area and the equilibrium price of my property drops, I have no claim. I can't Sue, I can't go to the government and say, well, my, the market value of my property dropped. I have no right to the value of my land. I have no right to prevent others from creating substitutes. It's kind of hard to think of creating substitutes for land, but there really are. I mean, not just the, what the Dutch have done with creating land out into their, their inner uh, basin in, in Holland, but um, you know, when you create multiple story buildings, you're really multiplying land when you do that. So I, I have no right to prevent others from creating substitutes for my property. So a legitimate monopoly right over land would be one that is gained when I homestead the land or when I purchase it from someone who has legitimate rights to the land. An illegitimate monopoly right is using a thug to prevent others from using their property to create a substitute for my property. It's illegitimate because I have no right to the property of others. I have no right to somebody's Honda they want to use to drive people around. And I have no right to the valuation that others place on my property. If other people say, well, I don't value your, your taxi services as much anymore because there's some other people over here providing a service that I think is roughly equivalent, and I choose to use them instead of your services, and unless you lower your price, I'm just not going to do business with you anymore. Do I have the right to prevent someone from saying that or doing that? So it's, it's surprising sometimes the traps that people will fall into when they start thinking, well, you know, monopoly rights, monopoly right, right? Taxicab medallion, right to my land, meh pretty much the same thing, except one of them involves a thug and the other one does not. One of them involves artificial restrictions on other people's property and the other does not. All right, what about this argument that capitalism is aesthetically obnoxious and environmentally irresponsible? And you've heard these kinds of things before, urban sprawl and look at all the awful things that are happening because um, because of the uh, expansion of businesses into otherwise pristine environments. Mises says only romantic prepossession can induce an observer to ignore the fact that more and more citizens of the capitalistic countries live in an environment which cannot be simply dismissed as ugly. Now I have, I have had um, a few things to say about this in print. Um, one appeared in, in the um, Fee uh, magazine, I think it was called The Freeman at, at the time, and um, I, I, I said in the article, I said, I, I enjoy a pristine environment. I like to go hiking. I enjoy uh, the marshes in South Carolina, going out in a kayak or a boat in the marshes. I enjoy forests. I enjoy mountains. I enjoy the, the outdoors. I don't think that burger joints and strip malls are more attractive than those things. And though I don't see some kind of approaching real estate apocalypse, I do understand the desire to see a part of nature that's not, doesn't have structures on it, or signs, or billboards. 
And a lot of Americans seem to have similar desires, which is why housing developments that maintain more open space and larger lots and tree uh, uh, um, forests and, and um, other natural environments tend to obtain a higher price. Most of us who don't have the funds to afford those things have to be satisfied with a small rectangle of crowded public access beach or a high density high rise or a condo that's surrounded by a parking lot instead of marshes. Now that's, there, there, there are several ways to deal with this, this objection to the urban sprawl. One is to try to convince people not to go to the beach and inhabit those condos and those high rises, and then if there's not the demand, there's not gonna be the supply, and you'll have more open space. Another approach would be for people who prefer undeveloped land to buy the land from people who, um, who own it, and then restrict development. Uh, that's the method preferred by groups like the Nature Conservancy, which will acquire property, and then they'll have an, um, restrictions on the use of that property according to the desires of the person who donated the land. Alternatively, the government could prevent people from exercising their preferences by restricting development in several ways. And they, they could completely ban development as with national seashores and that kind of thing. They could have a partial restriction on the property. But that approach is no less expensive than private purchases of land to hold the land in reserve. It's passed on in various ways to taxpayers and the consumers of coastline, and invariably those restrictions reduce the availability of things we like, housing, access to natural attractions, shops, and so on. Furthermore, I don't think that you can blame urban sprawl entirely on people who are seeking profits. And I say that because if you look at a typical development, you see a state-owned road or highway. You can't see, but you know that there are water lines and sewer lines. There's power lines that are some, sometimes a kind of a quasi-state firm, state-run firm, or heavily regulated public utility. So the government runs these roads into virgin territory, <coughs> runs water lines and sewer lines into virgin territory at the expense of the taxpayer, and then makes this land then more attractive to people who would like to build houses and shops and Burger Kings and everything else on it. Who's to blame then for this expansion out into wilderness? Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a discussion with somebody about this, I, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll recognize that there's no real way to determine what, a, what land use would look like in a libertarian society. There's no real way to tell. We've got things working in opposite directions. We've got governments on one hand encouraging land development with their extension of infrastructure and sometimes tax, uh, disparate tax regimes. And then you've got, um, on the other hand, uh, governments that are restricting development with various regulations. What would things be like if government stepped out of the infrastructure business, and if government stepped out of the regu land regulation business, what would land use look like? And I really can't tell you. It'd be difficult to say. And I think we have to be careful not to say, well, in a libertarian society, everything would be the way I want it to be or the way you want it to be. It, we'd probably see a, a great variety. I like variety. Oh, and then we get this. In the countries where you see a heavier degree of government involvement in land use decisions, you get this. Now, I understand that beauty is subjective. You might think this is beautiful. 
um, I may be imposing my idea of beauty and attractiveness on, on you, but I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that probably a lot of people would agree that's not, that's not terribly attractive. Well, then you get this, you know, occasional uh, disasters, environmental disasters, like uh, a few years ago, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Matthew Novak wrote a really helpful article on Mises Daily in 2010, June 23rd, if you want to look that up. He said, basically, part of the blame for this crisis has to rest on uh, the way that the government structured incentives for companies like BP. He said the government specifically passed laws that gave the oil companies incentives to drill far offshore, that is, in deeper water where the risk is presumably higher. It's easier to drill in 200 feet of water than it is to drill in 2,000 feet of water. Well, so that's what he says. Um, there's not only the, the ease of drilling, but the cost of dealing with any accidents or problems that do occur are necessarily greater in deeper water. And if you look at, the, um, at what's happened over time, this table shows you the share of Gulf of Mexico federal outer continental shelf natural gas and oil production from depths greater than 200 meters, which I, I don't know that much about um, diving, but I think 200 meters is about the maximum for scuba diving if you wanted to go repair something underwater. Um, and this is from 1995 through 2003. You see federal Gulf of Mexico production share from depths greater than 200 meters in percent, and you see that percentage is increasing. The reason for this has to do with changes in the tax regime. There was something like a five times increase during this period in the amount of oil that companies could pump royalty-free in deep water. Now suppose the government said, we're not laying claim to these underwater reserves of oil and gas. Whoever wants to go out and homestead the oil and gas reserves, go to it. Then you wouldn't have that disparate tax regime that is encouraging the drillers to drill in deeper water, where it is inherently more dangerous. So with the difference in taxes, there was an incentive and therefore a 250% increase in the percentage of oil coming from deeper water regions of the Gulf. Um, also, uh, there's the, the matter of liability, a secondary contributor, according to um, uh, Shugart, is uh, a federal law limiting liability for damages caused by offshore oil spills. The $75 million limit can be waived in cases of proven gross negligence, uh, might have been in the case of BP, but BP probably would have been far more cautious from the beginning if it knew that a blowout could cost them billions of dollars rather than millions of dollars. Now, in fact, they, after the fact, they, I think they were fined much, much, much more than that. But when you've got some kind of legal cap on how much you can be liable for, and I think this also applies to nuclear power plants, when you've got a legal cap, on how much you can be forced to pay, then you're going to be a little less careful than you would have been otherwise. Well, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll move through this fairly quickly, but there's also the argument that corporate scandals uh, show that capitalism doesn't work, as if government doesn't have scandals. I just find this amazingly um, one-sided. I mean, you get war, and you get government-induced famine, which is responsible for most famine, and genocide, and corporate welfare, and political scandal, and bribery, and corruption, and police brutality, and uh, deadly regulation, and, and fascism, and, and all the rest. Then there's this argument that capitalism is racist and sexist. I will spend a minute on this. In a free society... People are allowed to have whatever tastes and preferences they like. Just don't aggress against other people. But if you ignore productivity differences in order to favor one group, or if you, for that matter, if you ignore productivity similarities and favor one group over another, 
simply because you, uh, you've got some kind of, of um, bias that has nothing to do with, um, with productivity. And you're, you're, so you prefer to hire persons of type X rather than people of type Y, then you're going to suffer in the marketplace if there's no connection to productivity and if there's no connection to the, the um, preferences of your consumers. Government intervention can shield people from those costs of acting in that way. And we can see several examples of this. Jeff Jacoby, in a blog post on uh, Cafe Hayek, wrote that in the, in the case of uh, streetcar and bus segregation, he says, the owners of municipal transportation systems actively resisted segregation. They did so not out of some lofty commitment to racial equality or integration, but for economic reasons. Segregation hurt their bottom line. It drove up their expenses by requiring them, as the manager of Houston's streetcar company complained to city councilors in 1904, to haul around a good deal of empty space that is assigned to the colored people and not available to both races, end quote. In many cities, segregations, uh, segregation also provoked blacks to boycott streetcars, cutting sharply into the company's profits. One study produced, uh, published by uh, Jennifer Roback in uh, the Journal of Economic History showed that in one southern city after another, private transit companies tried to scuttle segregation laws or simply ignored them. So in Jacksonville, Florida, in 1901, there was an ordinance that required black passengers to be segregated. It went unenforced until 1905 when the state legislature mandated segregation statewide. The new statute was passed by the legislature much against the will of the streetcar companies, according to one newspaper at the time. In fact, so well known Moore says, or Roback says, um, was the company's hostility to segregation that when a group of black citizens challenged the law in court, their attorney felt compelled to deny being in cahoots with the railroad lines in Jacksonville. Now, um, uh, George Leaf, talking about Jim Crow laws in southern states, uh, points out that you know, these were laws, for those of you that are not familiar, these are the laws that said that certain jobs in industry could only be done by white workers. Now, if the industrialists were intent upon discriminating, Leaf says, why do we need a law to make that happen? And Leaf says the answer is that to preserve the status of the white worker, there had to be a legal restraint on employers. In the absence of the law, competition from non-discriminating employers would have urged all to hire and promote blacks and whites on the basis of economic value and not upon race. Um, one of the reasons for the adoption of the policy of apartheid in the 1930s was that white workers were incensed that so many blacks were being hired and were competing with them on the basis of pay. So they persuaded the government to restrict the better paying jobs to whites. Case after case after case. Now, this is not to say that people don't have preferences that you might call racist, but it does indicate that if you want to act upon those preferences, you're gonna have, to, you're gonna have government on your side in a lot of ways. At least that's what the history seems to indicate. And there, there are several other examples of this kind of thing. Um, very quickly, you've seen this, and we talk about the Austrian business cycle theory repeatedly over the course of the week. There's several books that are great on this. This is just a small selection. But um, the idea that capitalism is prone to bubbles and panics, I, I think that that can be very adequately addressed with Austrian business cycle theory. There's also this argument that capitalism won't, won't pursue important projects, space exploration or um, big things like hydroelectric dams. Um, well, there are a lot of calculation problems involved here. What's an important project? Um, 
I, I did an article, a short article, on the uh, space shuttle program, which mercifully ended some time ago. Um, and uh, you, you get a wide separation between what was promised and what, what actually happened. The, the projections in advance of the space shuttle uh, program in the 70s was that they would have uh, $118 per pound to get something, in, something into orbit. And what actually, in, in, in fact, happened is that the cost ended up being something like $27,000 per pound into orbit. Um, th they were saying, well, we'll be able to fly these things every several weeks because, see, the turnaround's going to be so fast and we'll be able to get these things back up into, the, into uh, space and it'll just be up and down all the time with the with these shuttle flights, and what they actually found was that the overhauls between the flights cost around $1.5 billion and required months. And clearly, from two tragedies that occurred in the shuttle program, uh, those overhauls were evidently missing some things. And then, of course, you get this last, uh, this argument that capitalism leads to the production of objectionable goods and services. Um, uh, Walter Block's book, uh, Defending the Undefendable, has recently come out with a second edition of this. So that's a great um, resource in that regard. Um, and, and just to, to end here with a, a mention of uh, Mises in that book that I, I quoted from earlier, Economic Policy. He said, certainly there are people who smoke too much. He's writing this in the 50s, by the way. Um, the Mad Men days. I watched Mad Men a little bit, and everybody's just smoking. I, I actually had a, had a um, New Year's resolution one year that I was going to start smoking and never followed through on it. But not really. I just said that to needle my leftist friends. Um, Mises said, certainly there are many people who smoke too much and who smoke in spite of the fact that it would be better for them not to smoke. This raises a question which goes far beyond economic discussion. It shows what freedom really means. He says, certainly the capitalistic system can be abused and is abused by some people. It is certainly possible to do things which ought not to be done in a moral sense. But a disapproving person always has a way to attempt to change the minds of his fellow citizens. He can try to persuade them, to convince them, but he may not try to force them by the use of power, of government police power. All right, well, I'll stop there, and I think I've got uh, four or five minutes for questions, if you have any. Yes? Wow. Me, well, me, 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 me. It, it, okay, you should, and for the benefit of the audio, you're saying that the taxi drivers make, you say, in New York City, make about 30000 a year if they work more than 40, 40, hours. 40 hours a week, and Uber drivers make 90, 90. If, median of 90000 a year if they drive more than 40 hours a week, so full time. Yeah, that even, that even makes that headline from Pando.com even more ridiculous. They're calling this Uber exploitation. And, well, they're paying three times. I didn't know this. They're paying three times what taxi drivers are making. I mean, they should be celebrating this, right? Aren't they about the worker and the poor, downtrodden, uh, underpaid, exploited taxi driver? And now these drivers are getting $90,000 a year. But because they don't have a bronze medallion on their hood... They're, uh, they're evil. <laughs> yes? So you, you gave an example of if someone wanted to uh, restrict the development of coastline, they could buy the coastline. Yes. Uh, how would that work with homesteading? Could you just say, I, I don't want anyone to develop these thousand miles or whatever? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't think, like I, was, I think I said in one of my earlier talks this week, I don't think you can be like Christopher Columbus, just, you know, beach your rowboat on the, on the shore and plant your flag and say all the coastline all the way to the North Pole that way and the South Pole that way is mine or King whoever's and I, I can't 
I can't do that. I mean, I'd have, to, I'd, I'd have to actually, in the Lockean sense, mix my labor with the land. And I'm not sure exactly how that would look. And I'm not sure what the exact institutional arrangements would be. But um, currently, the system is that the government says that the, the um, I've forgotten the term now for it, but the, there's a certain space of coastline, the beach itself, that is, I think they call it the entail, I can't remember, but that's, um, you, you can't own that. Um, or at least the government is the only owner possible. Yes, right next to you. Yes. Persistent. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you're, so, for, again, for the audio, you're, you're saying a lot of this is really easy to find, the, the evidence against these kinds of objections to markets. Why do you think the, that there's such a persistence of these ideas, these anti-capitalistic ideas? And I, I think that even though the evidence against this is easy to find for you, for me, it's not always obvious to a lot of people. They've been told stories from the time they were in kindergarten. And the public schools of this country and others have repeated these mythologies about how the world works. And you're, I ask my students when they come into my classes to take a principal's class, they haven't had economics before, at least not since high school, and I say, well, what were you told about the causes of the Great Depression? What do you believe about it? And they'll say, well, I think that the Great Depression was caused because people speculated too much in the markets and that they, they, they borrowed to buy stocks and the stock market got out of control and then the stock market crashed because too many people were greedy. And I mean, you get the same kind of repeat on the most recent recession in the United States, uh, which Tom Woods uh, aptly dispensed with in his book, meltdown, but you still see people that, that believe these things, and again, I think it's because they have not, they've not even considered, the, they've not gone looking. Uh, I, I read somewhere many years ago that the, um, the average American reads less than one book a year, and, and then just recently, and I, I, I heard this at a talk, so I don't have the source on this, that there was a study, country by country study of, of attention span. And the average American adult had an attention span of um, eight seconds. For comparison, I don't know how they figured this out, but for comparison, they said that the average goldfish had an attention span of nine seconds. <laughs> so what are we up against here? I mean, now, I, I, I didn't hear the rest of it because I lost my, I didn't pay attention. <laughs> Not, not really, but uh, I've got time for one more. Yes, optimist. Yeah, well, even if the government's, let's, let's say that you're saying, well, how do you know that the, the increased number of cell phones and so forth is due to, to um, uh, markets and not to government simply handing this out? And government can change the distribution of the wealth. They can, they can extract wealth from one person and buy a cell phone with it and hand it to somebody else. So they can change the distribution of wealth, but they can't create it. So if you want to have, a, I mean, governments that hand out a lot of stuff, like cell phones or refrigerators or whatever else, governments that hand out a lot, of, a lot of stuff have to get the wealth from somewhere. And the only way to do that is by sucking that wealth out of the productive uh, part of society. So there has to be, I mean, even, even in a society where you get this kind of welfare state, the welfare state can only hand out the largesse if it's got some kind of market system over here that's being very productive they can extract that wealth from. So I would say, yeah, you can, you can find governments that um, 
Well, I mean, again, if you look at the, if you look at just the index of economic freedom, you see also that there's a high correlation between the level of economic freedom and the um, and the the prevalence of these kinds of things, uh, the the availability of refrigeration and air conditioning and telecommunications, et cetera. All right, I, I am really actually a minute over, so I will stop here and thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>